Well, welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. This is episode number 83. I'm so glad you're here. Remember now, if you like what you're hearing, you can get this and a lot more over there at DanJohnUniversity.com. Uh, sign up for the free two-week membership, or if you just want to do something a little bit smaller, go to Patreon and sign up at Coach Dan John. Welcome and hello. We have a great question from Dustin to start everything off. Dustin basically says this, I turned 40 in April and I have two boys, four and five. I was about, time-wise, we, we were about the same with my daughters. In the past, I've tried to seek out new challenges to train for such as training for a marathon, increasing my deadlift, improving my mile time, etc. I, I, I like those uh, different options there. That, that's, there's some brilliance there. However, my only goal right now is to be able to keep up with the boys as they get older. Recently, I've been using your program, such as Easy Strength for Olympic Lifting and the Transformation Program, which, which are really good options to stay young and explosive so that I can maintain my athleticism. Besides the obvious answer of play, thanks for taking the best answer, do you have any advice on how to make sure I can keep up with the boys in whatever athletic pursuits they challenge me with in the upcoming years? Well, sure, Dustin, but don't 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 let me dismiss play yet. Um, you know, with my grandchildren, just a little bit older than your boys, you know, Josephine and I play catch with the football every time I see her. Uh, Danny and I kick the ball back and forth. When they ride their bicycles outside, I ride my bicycle outside. Uh, if you take them to a park and they're doing monkey bars, do monkey bars with them. If there's a balance beam, balance beam with them. Uh, I can't say enough of the importance of you as a role model for their health, fitness, longevity, and performance. But I want to add two more things. And this all comes from a an interesting afternoon. God, long time ago. I was a sophomore in college. Eric Subert and I were going up to the Pacifica Barbell Club, uh, Dick's place. And my motorcycle was broken and we didn't have a car. So we had to walk to the bottom of Westboro Boulevard and then hitchhike all the way up to the top of Pacifica, Sharks Park, like a Sharps Park, <laughs> and walk down the hill, jump over the fence in Dick's backyard, work out, and then to come home, jump over the fence, walk up this massive hill, hitchhike home, and then walk the two miles. <laughs> well, this guy picked this up, and uh, Eric and I were talking about something stupid. Maybe it was Three's Company or something like that. And uh, we asked the guy, do you watch Three's Company? He goes, I don't have a television. And we thought that was the weirdest thing I'd ever heard in my life. And the guy told us a couple of things, and... Uh, I got to tell you, at first it sounded weird, but now I can't believe how much of this advice I used. He, he basically said that every night he grabs one of his kids and he goes for a walk. And the kids always fight. I don't want to go. I want to play Yahtzee or read this comic book or whatever they, whatever they were doing. And he said that by the time they got out, it was only a few feet. By the time they're out of sight of the front door, all of a sudden, the kid would start talking about school, and uh, there's a bully at school, or there's an interesting project on Martin Luther King going on at school, or there is a, doc, talking about the Revolutionary War, I don't know, a poem, it doesn't matter. And even if the walk was a minute, two minutes, ten minutes, the child just kind of unpacked what was going on in her life, and he said, it's weird, because every time we went on the walk, our relationship got a little deeper. I knew what was going on in the life. I knew it was uh, what was up and what was down. Um, that, I, I think that was brilliant. And so first off, take one, doesn't have to be every single night, but a couple nights a week, grab one of them, take a walk, and just let it happen. The second thing is, and this is a lesson I learned from this, the, the first lesson, no TV on school nights in our home. Uh, Sunday through Thursday nights, no television. Uh, I would also reach out and say no internet. None of this stuff, okay? Um, my daughters didn't have, weren't allowed to watch TV on school nights, so basically they'd go to bed by 8, 8.30 throughout most of their lives. So they were sleeping 10 and 11 hours through elementary, middle, and high school. I think it helped them athletically. In fact, I almost know that's for sure. I know it helped him academically. 
Um, I just, those are just two ideas. I mean, and, but I think being a good parent and keeping yourself as a role model for fitness, health, longevity, performance, fat loss, and blah, 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 is you, you know, walking with them. You know, the great line out of the Gospel of Luke cha chapter 24, walking with somebody. Um, boy, I hope this all works for you, Dustin. Uh, you're in for the adventure of your life. Uh, so good luck to you, okay? And thank you. Bye-bye. We have a question from John. What a nice name. Outside of a training program incorporating Dan's favorite exercises of lunges and heavy Turkish get-ups, you may wipe the sarcasm off the screen now. Yeah, I'll wipe you. Was wondering what you'd recommend for correcting asymmetrical leg strength after knee surgery, uh, quadrips, uh, quadriceps tendon repair. Hmm. I'm three months out from surgery and I am cleared for strength training, not cleared for running or sprinting, but I am cleared for strength training as long as I'm not an idiot. And that's always the million dollar one, isn't it? That idiot part. Hey, listen, uh, I had a nice talk with a physical therapist a while ago. I mentioned this in some of my podcasts and workshops, but uh, he asked a nice question. He said, so how did we do as physical therapists? And I, and I, I kind of went, hmm, hmm, hmm. I said, you guys are really good at the red light. I use the semaphore, red, yellow, green. And I said, you know, when I, when I recover from surgery, you guys are there. You helped turn me on the bed. You know, I got all that stuff plugged into me in all kinds of places I don't want to talk about. Uh, and then I stand up and you show me how to use a walker. You show me how to use crutches. You teach me how to use the, you know, the, the, the bar on the stairs, the banister. You're good at that. And I think you're real good later on saying you're fine. It's that middle part, the yellow, you're not very good at. And you're, you are definitely in the yellow light situation right now. And I said, and this is where I came up with that idea of the bag of groceries, you know, you come home from to, you know, to cook Thanksgiving dinner and you've got 18 bags of groceries and they weigh a fair amount, each one of them. How are you going to carry them into the house? Well, for me, oh, and there's 10, there's 10 stairs, not 10 flights of stairs, 10 stairs. For me, I'm just going to load up all 18 of them and carry them up that flight of stairs. Someone listening is going, that's stupid. I would carry one at a time and have 180 stairs versus all that load. Well, between 18 bags at once and 18 round trips, that's what I call work capacity. That ability to pick and choose, have a matrix of options. And right now you're in that matrix of options time. So one of the things you have to do is build your work capacity. Here's the thing. You can probably train your upper body as hard as you hard as you ever have. Uh, of course, I would kind of push you over to the machine world a little bit, just so you don't have to have any, don't have to worry about stability on the leg. But the nice thing is when you are doing hypertrophy or strength work, those hormones that are bouncing around to repair your deltoids and your pecs, they're also swimming downstairs to help your leg recover. I would train your, your non-surgical leg as hard as you can. Now, it is true, the leg, the, so the, the stronger leg is going to get stronger. But again, you're pumping through all that stuff, and it's all good for you. And you got to do what you can do with the, in, the, injured, the injury recovery. I'm a big fan of the machines, uh, and I, you know, I know someone's going to say leg extensions are bad for you, but they're, they're fine for a short period. Leg curls, some kind of modified leg press. You know, I was thinking about this when I read this question. If you have a glute loop clamshells and hip thrusts pushing those knees apart, uh, that little bit of isometric pressure on the outside of the knee is going to be good for you. I wouldn't sprint into doing goblet squats or overhead squats or anything or, you know, <laughs> leaping off of buildings or anything. But uh, at three months, you're still in the period where you've got to build your work capacity back up. So... <clears throat> Anything you can do is a step forward and uh, take your time, do what you can do, uh, really push what you can push, and then just be gentle and smart on what you can't push. Boy, I hope that helps. Uh, I've been there. I know what it's like. Uh, and good luck to you, okay? Thank you. So Conley has a question for us. That's a great name, Conley. 
I'm a 34-year-old programmer who played sports in high school and college, but spent the past 10 years regressing into a shell of my former self. I have decided to commit to a proper strength and conditioning program, but after some testing in the weight room, I found that my mobility, if you can call that that, is on par with your average shuffling geriatric. Ouch, that hurt my feelings. My hamstrings, hip flexors, and groin are all especially tight, and the prospect of getting into the proper position to execute squats and even deadlifts is non-existent. Eight to ten hours a day at the computer has definitely caught up with me. Can you please give me a roadmap how I can begin to unpretzel myself? A side note, I am 6'5 and 220. The fact that you're only 220 is kind of impressive at 6'5, uh, considering you said you let 10 years go. But I, I do want to talk about this, uh, the mobility issue. I, I wish I had known a little bit about your sleep pattern, but um, in my one, two, three, four assessment, the three, question number one on three is, how many pillows does it take for you to sleep comfortably at night? And if you're more than one, you're a mobility client. You've already told me that you're a mobility client. And what's interesting is that what's stiff on you really does tie in to that, uh, that older work of uh, Yonda and with the tonic and phasic muscles. Um, I still believe that that's a good model to start with. And I know there's some psychopaths online who are not good people who attack Yonda's work. And uh, they're afraid to raise their hand when I point them out at workshops. Um, I would suggest as best you can is to think about you training with me. I'm 63 and at my age, I need hypertrophy and mobility work. To undo these last 10 years, I'd like to see us play back and forth a little bit here with doing some uh, hypertrophy work, especially any kind of vertical press, so uh, uh, military, you know, one arm press, two, you know, however you work it out, you, you can figure it out. And any glute working you do, that could be deadlifts. Uh, at your height, I would recommend rack deadlifts. Start off with maybe one inch above the knee. So really, and boy, there's there's your start. Rack deadlifts and military presses five days a week. Uh, power to the people program, easy strength style. And then between every set, do a hip flexor stretch, do a reasonable hamstring stretch, do a reasonable uh, groin stretch. Uh, your rest periods should always be mobility work. And in fact, I recommend that really for about everybody. But, you know, keep your reps, I don't know, anywhere between 8 and 15 reps. Uh, you know, train, train that higher rep category. And as you're recovering from that, get a little stretch on. The two best stretches... I'm just guessing here, but for most former athletes, is simply hanging from the bar and sitting at the bottom of the goblet squat, pushing your knees apart. Do those for 30-second bouts, maybe between sets of presses and rack deadlifts. Uh, and then uh, for hip flexor stretch, uh, go to my YouTube channel and look up what I've, uh, I've already given you. I think hip flexor stretches have to be done in a very, very specific way. Um, I'm so glad you caught this at 34, not 44. Um, the other thing I want you to think about is sleep. And of course, and it's so obvious, I, I, I almost forget it, your nutrition. I sure hope you're eating protein and veggies at every meal and drinking a lot of water. Conley, I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a question from Pedro. Thanks for, thanks for asking, Pedro, because that's a good question. In your experience, have you noticed any differences between the rep ranges that male and female clients respond better to? And then the follow-up question is going to be, to me, is seamless with the first question. Do you make any adjustments depending on the gender of the client? Well, let's do this first. Let's talk about equipment. The bench press in most facilities, the bench is far too high for the lower leg to shank of most females. Yeah, I know we put the 45 pound plates so or we put blocks underneath it. Why don't we just get benches that are more appropriate to women? Uh, when you work with kettlebells, especially the early kettlebells, my God, the handles were this thick. And that's way too big for a lot of females' hands. Now we have the much thinner handled ones and I, and I, and I applaud it vigorously. 
I have a female Olympic lifting bar and it was a, a game changer for me coaching the Olympic lifts with females. Uh, yeah, it's a touch lighter, but it's also, it's a little bit thinner. So equipment is a big issue when we talk about females and we got to do a better job, but we've seen a lot of progress. When you talk to women about squatting, very often they'll say, there's no, there's no pin position for me to put a squat rack. Uh, there's a gap between like, I don't know, five foot and five eight. And a lot of women are in that middle part. Um, so there you go. Um, the most important thing I ever f read was the physiology of strength. And uh, the, the author, uh, Heidinger, has these concentric circles. So the first one is down here over the hips and, uh, and, and stomach or waist or whatever. And the thing that the German research has discovered is that women can get about 80% as strong as men there. So, you know, if you got a guy squatting naturally 500, it's believable you could occasionally find a woman who could squat 400. Those are, those are good sized numbers. And I'm talking about squatting, not the stuff I see on the internet. Um, but it's weird. So you got 80% of here. And as the concentric circles moved out, women in relation in relative to men got weaker. And it, this really helped me as a coach because this, this, this little extensor here, uh, the, the forearm extensor, women can only get about 55% as strong as men. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm teaching a, a bunch of young people how to, to throw the shot put, the boys and girls will both be able to rotate or glide on day one, but the girls need a little extra work with lighter balls uh, on, on that, that flip. So, you know, you could use a softball or, uh, or load it up to maybe a one kilo ball or two kilo ball. But women need extra time as throwers to get that movement done, especially when you add the ballistic of the glide or the rotation to it. Um, so you have to be aware that women are going to be a little bit weaker in certain areas in training. The concentric circle model is magnificent um, than men in some areas. But that leads us to the issue with between the belly button and the chin. And that's the problem women have with uh, most, especially upper body pushing stuff, the press family. I always think about Mindy who could bench 140 for a single. That's impressive. But she could bench 135 for 10. And one of the great things I picked up is that women's max and rep scheme is radically different for men, uh, especially when it comes to upper body push and even pull in some cases, m most cases, I think. So you can't use any magic numbers. Uh, uh, a female lifter, especially early, might be able to get 10 reps with a weight. And then when you jump up just a little bit, barely can get one. And so when you're programming the female uh, athlete, client, you just have to keep in mind that the press, especially, is always going to be, and I'm going to say odd, but don't, but don't read into that. If you have, like I have, I've been lifting since 1965. Uh, I didn't start coaching women until 78. Um, so I'm relatively new at it, only, only 44 years of coaching women. It takes a while to stop making these assumptions about women and pressing. You, you can't use percents. It's very difficult to use percents. I have modified many of my best programs to work with women. And, you know, famously uh, with, with my daughters when they were, their daughters in that team when they were in high school, this is over a decade ago, how I had to change one of my most standard Olympic lifting programs to fit the uh, to fit the female athlete, and I had friends look at it and they go, "This is unrecognizable from the magic program that I had given them." And I go, "No, it's not. It's reasonable and acceptable for what I'm doing with the females." Now that you can go up half a kilo and a kilo on an Olympic barbell, things are miles better. But when you had to make, you know, five pound jumps only with the Olympic bar, and that's if you had the two and a halves and they weren't broken. That boy, that became difficult. You know, Pedro, I hope that helps. Uh, I'd like to let you know that 
I think about this a lot and I'm trying to do my best uh, both as a, with my voice and my actions to, to, to get us farther along. So thank you. Excellent question. We have a question from Stuart. Um, my kilt is Royal Stuart. I know you've mentioned to people about really owning a kettlebell weight if you're unable to get a heavier one to get the most out of it. I was wondering if it's worth doing this anyway in the long run rather than trying to always move up in weight. Wow, you know, Stuart, I like that because that is the classic tradition that I actually grew up with is that you, at gyms, they had fixed barbells, you know. Uh, there was a 75-pound barbell next to an 80-pound barbell next to a 90. And so if we were bench pressing, I had to walk over the rack, pick up the 75, walk over to the rack, stick it up there, do my lift, whatever the lift was, walk it back, put it back in. Uh, and they always stood up like this. Oh, that's, a, that's a while ago. And the one thing you had to do is you had to be cognizant of, you know, you, you had to be able to master that weight. And the, the strongman tradition is basically what I just said. Uh, you, 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 you follow up with this. I like the idea of going back to my 16 kilo uh, kettlebell and mastering the kneeling bottoms up press, for example, or am I unlikely to get any more benefits than I would from a standard overhead press with a heavier bell? Remember, the foundation of getting strong is tension, learning to use tension, learning to light it up and you know, let it go. You know, let it go, bring it back, let it go. Uh, I think track and field, especially my events, are a study of that. So I like your idea of doing the half kneeling bottoms up because that's going to force you to have tension throughout the whole system. While that bell is bottoms up like this, it's going to be doing, it, you're going to be fighting all that. Being in the half kneeling position, you know, your pelvis is going to be fighting all over the place. I like the idea. I wouldn't, I, I don't want you to think either or on this. Both of these have value. In fact, one of my favorite things if someone can't press a bell is I have them uh, clean it two hands and walk around in the rack, rack position. It Clean it two hands, use both hands to drive it up, and then walk around in the waiter's walk position with it. Okay? And the idea is that walking, that training with the heavier bell is going to help you long-term with your strength. So try not to get either or on me, but I like where your head's at. Thank you, Stuart. So we have a question from Jason. On the Easy Strength for Fat Loss program, how important is that the walk begin immediately after the strength exercises? This comes from Rusty Moore at this point. So the weightlifting frees up free fatty acids, and then the walk burns them up. Your question is good. Let's continue on because you're about to do something that I think is more important than what I recommend. My neighborhood is not conducive to walking, so I typically load up the dog, the baby, and the jogging stroller and drive to a local park to walk. It's a 5 to 10 a minute drive plus loading time. Will delaying the walk like this diminish the effectiveness of the program? Okay, I just drop in right now. Jason, the fact that you're with your dog and your baby is far more important than the effectiveness of the program. And long term, your memory of this walking is much more important than whether you lose, you know, uh, I was going to say the, the most minimum of, of the difference in what you're doing and what I'm recommending for fat loss. I'm not sure it would be measurable. Uh, I need a much better scale. Uh, but uh, you, you, I love the idea of walking your dog and baby. Um, should I say maybe save the kettlebell swings until after I get to the park to ramp my heart rate back up? Or I could modify the exercise so the strength routine could be done at the park, ab wheel, half an inning press, chin up, single leg, and swings. What do you think? Is there an alternative that I'm missing? Here's the alternative. Do the workout. Trust me, getting a dog and a baby in a car is going to keep your heart rate up. Getting a dog and a baby out of a car, onto a leash, into a stroller, that's going to raise your heart rate. No, I think, Jason, you're doing just fabulous. And uh, it makes me happy that you've included me in your, in your family walk. So just you're fine. 
just fine. In fact, I'm impressed that you're doing all this. So work out, get the, <laughs> collar the dog and collar the baby, go to the park, walk, enjoy. You'll probably end up walking farther some days than all of us who do the, the program as written. Good luck to you, Jason. Boy, you're, you're in a good place right now. Thank you. We have a question from Scott. Hi, Scott. I have a question related to programming. Do you advocate for accessory work with your workouts? I don't know if a question could be more vague and broad. Um, you know, in powerlifting, you know, you got Marty Gallagher, who's a, a big proponent of just doing the core, though his coach, Hugh Cassidy, did a, a accessory work. If you're from the Louis Simmons West Side School, accessory work is a very important thing. As an Olympic lifter, and if you're training for the, the Olympics and you're on the Chinese team, you're going to do accessory work. If you're an Olympic lifter and, and you're on the the Iranian team, you're not going to do uh, accessory work. So it really depends. Here's the thing. For the bulk of the people who, who listen to me, I would say even if you are focusing on the power lifts and the Olympic lifts, that little bit of hypertrophy work, you know, maybe after a snatch and clean and jerk workout, you add some curls and tricep extensions and whatever, you know. I think long term, that little bit of hypertrophy and mobility and joint work is going to pay off. I don't know if it's going to help your Olympic lifts at all, but if you're thinking about long-term health and longevity, yeah, it's worth your time. So my answer is yes for almost everybody listening. And be very careful for that small percent that's into, the, uh, into performance. Thank you. Okay, this next question is going to cause all kinds of people to comment down here telling me how wrong I am. But trust me, you ask my opinion, so that's what you're getting. Uh, if these other people want to start their own podcasts and put them up for free on the, on the internet, go ahead and do it. But at least listen to what I'm trying to say. We have a question from Patrick. I am considering purchasing a Concept2 rower and would like your opinion on them. Would this be a good investment in my home gym? No. What? Yeah, I bought a Concept2 rower. I got the E and I was, and you know where it is? It's across the street at my neighbor's house. He uh, he can't train in the winter. He's a, he's a cyclist. So I loan it to him every winter. It, I had loaned that out for almost three months and not a single person in our training group noticed. Uh, it cost me 1300 bucks. Uh, when I was teaching, when I, I needed kettlebells, uh, I called up a, a supplier for 1200 bucks, I got 107 kettlebells. Um, Patrick, if your home gym has 107 kettlebells, I'm guessing you have enough kettlebells. Uh, I don't see the cost to benefit ratio of it. Now, listen, I've got the books that say row an hour a day. I've got, I get it. My good friend Val, uh, who's just a, a marvelous young lady, my friend Dan Martin and others, uh, do the rower constantly and hats off to you. For most of us though, it just becomes a coat rack. Years ago, there was that study about treadmills here in the United States. The average use of a treadmill is 7.2 times. The rest of the time, it holds your clothes. Um, and people are paying four and $5,000 for treadmills to use it seven times. Listen, if you can't walk around the block, you're not going to use a treadmill. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of them. Because the cost to benefit ratio doesn't work out for me. And again, you're going to get all the people saying, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've had way too many conversations with people, good people, people I trust who said the same thing. I'm not being a jerk and I'm sure, I'm sure this company is not going to be sending me any t-shirts. But that's my opinion and that's just what I've seen. I use the Dan John workout generator three days a week and would like to add some cardio on the other days. I mean, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. But I would take my time. I mean, I have those little weights that I do heavy hands with. I get more benefit out of walking around the block a few times with weights in my hand than I did from any, any of that Concept 2 stuff. I get it. If you want to be the world champion indoor uh, racer, that's what you want to do. Good for you. Um, I just can't defend it. 
Your mileage may vary, but you ask me for an honest answer, Patrick, and you know how I can't help myself but be honest. Thank you. We have a question from Ben. I have been following Easy Strength for several months now with great results. Well, good. My deadlift has been single leg light kettlebell lifts to improve a muscle imbalance and overall stability. I now feel happy to, to increase the load and want to ask you a question. You may ask me a question, Ben. I plan to continue progressing single legs, but on opposite days start doing two-legged deadlifts. What are the pros and cons in either using a kettlebell or barbell for deadlifts? As a rule of thumb, is one better than the other? Okay, just remember, I'm not a fan of single leg barbell deadlifts. Um, <clears throat> two things about kettlebell deadlifts. Uh, I like if your left foot is down, you hold the, the bell in your right hand. We call that the suitcase position. And when you when you drop that, the, as the bell comes down because you hinge, uh, we call that filling the hole because your arm is filling the hole where the leg should be. That's number one thing. That's what we like to do. That's what I think is the best way to do it. The other thing is when you're doing single leg work, I like you to put your finger either on a wall, on a rack, or even holding a string from the ceiling so that your balance gets taken care of by <clears throat> this external thing. I hate it when I watch people doing single leg stuff and, they're, and their down leg, their knee is shaking all over the place. To me, that's just an invitation to injury. But when you do... The, when you do the barbell, it's two two hands, two legs for most people, almost all the time. I don't, uh, I have a friend, his book is back there, who hurt himself permanently doing a, a circus trick, a single leg uh, uh, with a barbell. And he's, he's done. I mean, he's, 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 he's bought the ticket with that injury. Uh, there's a lot of deadlift variations I like. I like the traditional with the mixed grip. I like the clean grip. I like the snatch grip. Um, those, those all change the position of your back. Uh, I like the heels together one, sometimes called the duck deadlift. We called it something else, but I, it's out of my head now. Um, I like rack deadlifts. I like deadlifts off boxes. I think those are great. I also like the Jefferson lift. That's when you uh, step over the bar with one foot and then you put your hands on the bar. It's kind of, I think that's also called the straddle lift in some places. Um, my friend Ben did a great job. Oh, <laughs> my other friend Ben did a great job uh, doing these with an easy strength protocol. If you do the Jefferson straddle lift, uh, I would su suggest a set of five with your hand, uh, with your like left leg forward, a set of five with your right leg forward. And it is true, if you go online, you might find different variations for the Jefferson and the straddle. But I I know what I'm talking about, but it, it doesn't matter what option you, prove, you, you pick. Um, I think the idea of moving through variations on the deadlift is a great idea. Um, I like the idea of starting in the rack, you know, and, I don't know, spend a couple of weeks you know, an inch above the knee, get it as strong as you can, lower it to an inch below the knee, then, you know, dropping the barbell on the ground and doing uh, heels together deadlifts. Uh, then after a couple of weeks of that, putting your hand, you know, normal stance, hands out the snatch grip. Uh, you'll constantly have to re rethink load and, uh, and you'll get sore in places you never thought. Uh, weirdly, I include the snatch grip deadlift as part of my armor building programs because people get weirdly sore in places that you often get collisioned in American football. So there you go. Uh, very good question. And uh, thanks for asking. It's, uh, it, you know, it's funny. I'm reading this. And I was like, yeah, I should do that too. So I appreciate that. Thanks so much, Ben. Well, there you go. Another episode of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Now, remember, if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every one, okay? Now, remember too, on YouTube, I have, I'm sneaking up on 1,900 videos. 
So very often, I've already answered your question. Uh, we're working right now on a, on a playlist so that you can go in and say, uh, okay, this, and the, you know, uh, you know, whatever. Um, uh, if you have a question about mass made simple versus easy strength, we'll, we'll delineate it for you. Uh, sadly, we should have done this on the very first day, but you know, <laughs> here we go trying to trying to backfill a, an issue that's come up in the past few years. Thank you again, and have a pleasant tomorrow.